the other way? Sure, you can do whatever you need to do. Absolutely. So um, I've got my tool. I'm holding. I'm not holding it precision. I'm holding it like this, like a whisk. Okay. So I'm going to go ahead and push as hard as I can to make the darkest mark I can make. And then I want you using circles, very small concentric circles, to start to pull out from that dark value and blend slowly. Don't use your finger to smudge. Small concentric circles and just lighten your touch. Now you can see like down here where I want it to get darker, those small concentric circles seem to really be my friend. But as I get out here further and I get lighter, my tool is almost like it, it needs to instead be sort of larger circles. And what I want to do is I want to really slowly blend. So I transition into the white of the paper. Whew, it's kind of tall up there. Transition into the white of the paper. as much as I can. Now it's kind of interesting because I don't know if you noticed, but when I was over here drawing, I was able to do more of like a vertical up and down with my circles. But the moment I moved over to the side, I could no longer do the same movement. And so that's a really good example for you about like um, trying to um, think a lot about how you're set up. So like on the side here, it's really easy for me to do these sort of vertical concentric circles. But when I move over here, I'm not able to do that anymore. I need to go horizontal. So that shows you that the way that you set up is really going to affect the way that you uh, draw. OK, so go ahead and do that and try to get it as light as you can. Your blending can be as long as you need it to be, but I want it to be like a really smooth transition. Okay. So today we're really starting to talk about value. Okay, which you've learned a little bit about. And value is, you know, the relative lightness or darkness of something. So you did this a little bit with your um, section value packet. And that's kind of like your first introduction. And so as we move today further into value, we're going to be looking at value in different sort of uh, modalities in terms of the drawing. So value is the um, you know, your range of light to dark. So on a value scale, depends on who you read, black can be 10 and white could be zero, or black could be zero and white could be 10, depending on kind of like who you read, it gets mixed around a lot. Um, and so when I think about it, you know, um, I think a lot about the quantity of light, okay? So like black as zero makes a lot of sense because that means that there's no light versus white as 10, which means that it's full of light. So depending on how you wanna think about it, um, the numerical association can be, um, 
can, like I said, can be different based on who you're reading. But one thing that doesn't really change is this idea of high key and low key. So go ahead and draw a line through the middle of your, your blend. Okay, and so then basically, if you draw that line in the center of your blend, then to the right of the line here with me, I have high and I have low. So this relates to the idea of high key and low key, okay? And basically high key means um, values that are more towards light and low key are more towards dark. Now this correlates to some of the earliest writings about color and um, the way in which color was associated with musical notes. And um, it also sort of gives us a verbal and oral language to describe something that is visual. So by that, I mean that when you're drawing, I can say you need to work more in your high key values. And you know that means any value above the center, which would be like a five. So in the center is the five, anything above five towards white is high, anything below five, um, you know, is low. So if black is zero, then we know then that we have, um, let me see if I can kind of move this around. If black is zero, then we know then that we have um, five to zero would be low and then five to 10 with white being 10 would be high. Okay. So when we're looking at a drawing, a drawing should always incorporate all of the range of values. It, it's not necessarily, um, you know, stylistically always uh, necessary, but in terms of like capturing information, typically, uh, you know, when we look at something in real life, it's gonna have all of the ranges of values that um, can appear on this little blended uh, um, chart. I guess it's a chart. I don't know. It's not really a chart. It's more like a, it's more like a smooth transitionary space. Okay. So um, go ahead and draw a boundary box. And again, I don't mind right now what which of the crayons you're working with. You have a, a 2B, I believe, and a 9B. So I would probably not, you know, use the 9B, um, but, um, you know, I'm fine either way. You know, I think that you can explore and, and play around a little bit and see what happens. I only ever got one crayon in my kit. Oh no, and which one is it? 2B, that's it. Mm. Well, that's okay. okay. Is it got a blue wrapper or no? Nope. Okay. It came in a box. Okay, actually, that one's perfect. <laughs> so, so do I need to get another one? No, we should. You should be fine. Okay. Yeah. You should be absolutely fine. Um, so um, and that's great. I don't know if anybody else is in that place. Um, but uh, I apologize for that. Um, you know, I've just had a little bit of a talk with Dick Blick, and so, um, I don't know if it. You know, it's hard. They, they make hundreds and hundreds of kits. So um, check to see if you were charged for it. If you were, you can give them a ring and, and ask about it. Um, and I apologize for that. Um, I'm gonna create a boundary box. And in the center, I'm just gonna put a sphere. Now you wanna draw your sphere from your whole arm, not from your wrist. So you can see the benefit to standing up is that I'm able to draw with my whole arm rather than my wrist. And then just like halfway through the sphere, just go ahead and draw your horizon line. Now, this is just very simple, very straightforward stuff. You may have even done this before. Stay with me, it's really important. So when we talk about value, we talk a lot about light logic.
Okay, so what is light logic? One now. Can you just pick the just pick the term apart? Semiotically? Sorry, ontologically. What two words are there? Is this on? Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, so what two words are there? Light and logic. Perfect. And so what do you think light logic means? The logic of light. Perfect. Thank you. That's perfect. That's what I was after. Uh, you know, please participate. <laughs> okay. You know, I hate going to the theater because they always seem to pull me out of the crowd. Uh, I'm not trying to pull you out of the crowd here. Okay. All right. Um, so the light logic is basically like the logic of the light. So here we're talking about the logic in which the light is falling on a form. So if we pull our light from the top right hand corner, then that means our light is going to transition through the space from the top right hand corner through to the bottom left hand corner. So the first thing that we can identify very easily then is the idea that this is going to have a shadow. So go ahead and create a contour of a shadow. I'm going to show you how to do this without any line at all. Um, but we always need to, you know, the reality is that we tend to always have some type of gestural line like this, always, even when we're only using mass until we get to charcoal. So the light is going to come from the top right. We're going to have a shadow casting towards the left. So you can go ahead and just assign a don't assign a black to the shadow. I don't want a low key value. I just want like a middle range value. Now, because the light's going to come from the top right, that means that this area here is going to be lighter. Okay, how do I know this? Because I've drawn so many spheres. <laughs> That's how I know this. Okay, this is like, um, this is like drawing as, you know, like this is symbolic drawing. This is drawing in terms of like step by step drawing. This is, um, you know, very much like something I've done so many times. And so I know what's going to happen. So light is going to come from the top right. That means that the right area here will be light. Okay, so that means all of this is going to be within lower key values, but it won't all be, you know, twos and ones. Some of it are going to be higher keys because of the reflected light. So we don't want to overemphasize the area in terms of dark. So go ahead and put in a value that is um, lighter than the value you put into the shadow right now. Now you all watched my video. So how do I make how do I make the light here step forward without drawing a line around it? What do I do to make the light step forward without drawing a line around it? Make more middle tones around it. Uh, perfect. And where would that go? You would go around the light or where you perfect. want it to be. Perfect. So if we go ahead and come through here and put in a tone behind the light, then the tone that's behind the light and surrounding the light will make that light step forward. So go ahead and, and apply your tone to the background. Now there are some different parts of value that were covered in the video. Okay, we have the highlight, the light, the shadow, the core of the shadow, reflected light. Often you'll hear people talk about the midtones as well, which is the tones between light and dark. 
So the way that this is going to fall basically is going to create um, a darker area inside. So we put in this tone here and inside that tone, we're gonna put in the darker darks right here. So that's gonna be what we call the core of the shadow. So go ahead and put that in. Don't take it all the way down to the bottom. Okay, like that. The reason you're not gonna take it all the way down to the bottom is because light bounces from the surface to the ball to create reflected light. So as you blend it down, this side over here will be a bit darker because it's not touching the surface. And so in here, you can see that there's still some light from that reflected light. To make the reflected light stand out and to solidify the shadow, there's gonna be a heavier line underneath the sphere where it's touching the surface. This is called the shadow line. So now we don't want to apply any more value in here, okay? The shadow line usually blends a little bit into the shadow. And then there's usually reflected light in the shadow. And then the shadow usually has a core of the shadow. You replicated this on the skulls by finding the contours of the lights inside the shadow. Shadows are not black. Now, because the surface of the light like the surface of the sphere, excuse me, because of the location of the light to the sphere, we're gonna imagine that it's pretty close. Therefore, the shadow is going to be pretty closed, okay? It's going to mimic the shape of the sphere. If the light was a long way away, then the shadow might be open. So we can mimic that by putting my hand near the paper. So. I have lights on so you can see. So when my hand is further away from the paper, do you see the shadow's not really very distinct? I mean, it is, but it's not. But then as I get closer and closer and closer, the shadows get more and more closed. So the further my hand is away from the paper, the more open the shadow is. The closer my hand gets to the paper, the more closed the form is of the shadow. So we're gonna have a closed form, it's darker in the middle, and then we have our reflected light, our shadow line, our reflected light, and then we have our shadow, and then that comes up through here again into the core of the shadow. So go ahead and re-emphasize the core of your shadow. And then try to blend that into the lighter areas that you put down originally. And transition into the lights just like you did up here. The, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna match the value I'm applying now to the value of the line I drew to separate my lights from my midtones. And then I'm going to blend through it into the light. So it's pretty transitional.
Now the surface that the sphere is sitting on also needs a value. So I'm gonna assign it a pretty high key value. And as it gets over towards the right here where the light is coming through, I'm gonna lighten it. Currently, the shadow line is the darkest thing. So that tells me I probably want to bring some darker low key values into the shadow and the core of the shadow. And here's my core of my shadow. And again, I'm not trying to draw with lines. I'm actually, as you can see, using the side of the tool. And I'm really keeping my wrist off the page. That's going to help me to not smudge my drawing as I make it. Okay. All right, so now what we wanna do is back here in the background, let's go ahead and start to work that down a little bit darker, bring it up to the contour of the sphere, but do not redraw the contour of the sphere. Now go ahead and transverse over here, transverse the outside edge of the sphere with the background you see. I'm not stopping, I'm drawing through. And as I draw through from the background into the sphere, it starts to disappear. Do you see? That tells us that we need to make a decision in a minute about which is more dark. But we want to just go ahead and think about these things as actually being kind of joined. Now, when you're applying value, it's, it's hard not to, but you don't want to draw a line and then draw out from the line. Instead, try to think about just bringing the value to the edge that you established earlier. Now here I get to decide, is the background darker than the sphere or is the sphere darker than the background? I'm gonna make this part of the sphere here darker than the background by just a couple of steps. By that I mean like if this is a six, or sorry, if this is a four and this is a three, these are steps. Sorry, you can't see that because I moved it. Um, so on the value scale, there are steps. And so like by steps, I mean like the increments of shifting in the value. And so over here, I'm just going to increase the darkness of my shadow on my sphere by just a couple of steps. And by doing so, the, the sphere is now stepping out from the background. You know, with mass drawing, backgrounds tend to go darker, but they don't have to be black.
the, this tells me here, if that's dark, then I need to make my core of my shadow darker. So I'm gonna go through and enhance that. And you can see now I'm using like little scribbles. Remember you did your nine squares, all those different types of marks. So try out some different marks, scribbles, circles, okay? Don't do lines, I don't want lines. Directional line, for instance, is a great way to add value, but we're not doing that right now. Then go ahead, you can strengthen the horizon line. Just a hair, don't overdo it. And then bring that value up into the darkness. Again, here you're gonna see me crossing over the boundary of the sphere. And once we start drawing like this, you can kind of see why I don't let students sit down in class because you really need to use your whole body. So if you watch my camera on the Zoom as well as the camera on the drawing, you'll see that I'm moving around quite a lot in terms of the way that I'm holding my tool. Sometimes I'm drawing up and down, sometimes I'm drawing at an angle. I'm really feeling the space with my whole arm. So now to get over here, I want to I want to define that edge a little bit more clear. I'm going to do that by coming to the other side of my paper because I need to pull down. So I'm going to define that edge a little bit more and I'm going to pull down because you're going to get more of a gentle curve when you pull down and then I'm going to blend out. Now I'm doing like these kind of like squiggly lines, adding value slowly, building up things slowly. You really want to see the texture of the paper, okay? Like don't try to annihilate the texture of the paper, really try to incorporate the texture of the paper. Okay, go ahead and work on that for a few minutes. I'm going to pause the recording. Okay, so I'm resuming the recording now. I mean, like I said, I figured out that if I record to the cloud, then I can actually just take the video without any of your videos in it. So you you won't be you know seen. So um, I'm sure that the name is down there. Uh, but anyway, who's this painting by? Anybody who's this painting by? I'm gonna Any guess, guesses? is it Derrida? Ooh, okay, really close. Same time period, also investigated um, pointillism. But this is not uh, Derrida. Okay, so it's Georges Seurat, okay or Soro, Soro. Um, I used to teach little kids that this was, you knew this was a Surat because of Surat the dot. Okay, so, um, but these aren't actually, uh, you know, if you've taken design with me, then you learn about points as being a, like as a point being a location, it's a concept. 
Okay, so these are these are more like dots rather than points, but we call this pointillism. All right. So you've probably seen this painting in some fashion at some time. It's, you know, it's even in Fer Ferris Bueller's Day Off, which you've probably all seen. It's one of those classic movies, um, I think. Um, so Soro is a post-impressionist um, and um, uh, did know the other, you know, he did know the impressionists. Um, and so this is a movement that we call pointillism. And what we're really interested here with his work is, um, why won't it let me zoom in? Oh, I guess that's the biggest I can make it. Um, what we're interested in here is this idea of optical, optical color mixing. <laughs> oh my goodness. It's like the browser is fighting me here. So in optical color mixing, then we are examining the notion of how color mixes in the eye. So, you know, the impressionists were really interested in the playfulness of color, like for instance, on water. And if you look at water, then what you see in water, right? Like it's like water is not blue. It's lots of different colors, the reflections, the light, even something like the translucency of the water based on the depth of the body of water affects the way that the water looks. I used to look on, live on this like little retention lake in Florida. Everywhere in Florida, there's retention lakes, you know, it's like they're everywhere. And um, at the end of this lake was this tree and I would go out and canoe on the lake. And when I would, um, beyond the lake in the morning, the tree would cast this really long shadow that was a very open shadow, right? So it didn't have closed edges. And so as the shadow of the tree fell across the water, it looked like the water was a different color in that area. And so it could have been a different color because of the depth, it could have been a different color because of, you know, the types of um, plants that were underneath. But really what this, was was this color of the water change was because of the shadow, but because the shadow was open, you couldn't determine that it was a shadow that was changing the water's color until later on in the day when the shadow became closed and you could see the, the actual shape of the shadow was the tree. So when we look at um, impressionists and post-impressionism, we're seeing the way that um, marks layered on top of one another optically mixing the eye to create a new color. So if you look at Soro and you squint your eyes at Soro, then all these little dots of color join together and become new colors. So they're optically mixing in your eye versus like the actual mixing of paint, which is then applied to a canvas as a single color. So to do this, Soro is using dots and you can see even the outside border has dots to differentiate it from the painting. And so as we zoom in here, we can see how, I wish I could zoom in more for you, but we can see how the shadow of the hat creates this like blue shadow in the hair. And there's not much of a distinguished transition between the shadow in the hat to the eyebrow it's kind of all blended together. But then when you squint your eyes, you can start to see that shadow, which here is like the shadow versus the eyebrow was kind of distinguished, but when I squint my eyes, they really kind of just mix away. And that is the way that we see value. You know, most value is not this extremely high contrast value system where white and black are highly definitive, um, highly defined by um, an edge most value exists between black and white. And it's the transition of the value, the soft transition that creates form. And so when we look at Soro, we can see that he's really blending, just like we tried to do with the sphere, the dress is blending into the grass, okay? The, the shadow behind the little monkey here is blending into the dress, is blending into the monkey. And so what you're really looking at is a, an attempt to capture the way that um, light bounces around and color optically mixes. 
So this is um, a Sunday on the Grand Jatte, which is an island in Paris. And does anybody know what the island was famous for? Okay, so the island was a famous place where you would go as uh, a man to um, inquire about the, uh, you know, the company of a lady. Okay, so this is a place for sex workers. Um, this is one of the places in the city that uh, men could go to find, um, you know, companionship um, and um, to find uh, sort of, you know, whatever could could uh, find a, a sex worker to share time with. Now we can see that the men are mostly bourgeois. We do have a working man down here. Uh, we do know it's a Sunday because the working man is here and he's not at work. Uh, you can thank the French for your weekends and your 40 hour work week. They are the people that originated that. Um, but when we do see these bourgeois men, we, we can distinguish them based on their hats, right? And their dress. Okay, now the women, um, and this is from a most recent video I watched on this by one of my favorite art historians. Um, and it was kind of mind boggling to me because I hadn't ever actually sort of considered this in the past, but the women are mostly unaccompanied. And that is an indication of their um, employment, you know, of their profession. Um, because they are unaccompanied for the most part, that means that they are there to seek out company. The young girls are an indication of sort of the, um, the idea of the young women being indoctrinated into the social, um, cultural sort of phenomenon of, um, you know, uh, em employment in, in sex work. So um, that is obviously, you know, I think changes the, the, the temperature of the painting and changes the mood of the painting. Okay, so um, that to me, I think is, uh, when I recently learned that, um, and it did come from my favorite art historian who I like to watch on YouTube. Um, yeah, I was like, whoa, that's really new information for me. Um, and that's information which I think is, um, changes the mood of the painting. This was a very fashionable place to go. This was um, in terms of, um, you know, bourgeois men. Um, and so it was, you know, a great sort of well-known location that everyone would have recognized in the Soro. Now, why am I going on and on about Soro? Well, the reason I'm going on and on about Soro is because first of all, I like art history a lot. And second of all, because I don't really like Soro paintings. Okay, I like his drawings. And that's, you know, I think you're probably like, well, yeah, you teach drawing, but I also am a painter. So, um, and I like what Soro is doing. I think Soro is a brilliant sort of technician and things, but to me his, and I do like Soro paintings, but to me, I want to look at his drawings. Like, look at this drawing. It's fantastic. It's full of so much light, even though so much of it is dark. Okay. And the way that Soro is drawing is um, mimicking what he's trying to do in paint. But I think he does it less successfully in paint. I think he really does it beautifully in his drawings. And so, what we're looking at with Servo's drawings, let me see if I can pull something up here without it going to Pinterest. Um, so when we look at this drawing, right, like what kind of words could you use to describe this drawing? Can you see the drawing? I can't see you all. I mean, I can, I can see some of you and you're speaking, but I can't hear you. Um. We can, I can see it. Okay, so what's the word you would use to describe it? Um, somber. Mm, okay, why? A person looks like they're in grieving. Okay, yeah, so we, we have a sense that this person is is grieving, their, their face is looking downwards. 
Okay. Um, what about the drawing is also adding to that sense? Like what makes you think that in terms of the way that the drawing, the light lot, like the light in the drawing, what is it? Uh, well, you can only see like the face that is really uh, bright. The rest is uh, very dark, has very dark values. And also it's not very well defined. So it's like you can only see the person's face but nothing else, kind of like as if they were just showing you part of themselves and hiding the rest. Okay, that's a, that's a really nice um, description. Thank you. So we're seeing definition on the face and everything else is kind of open. So this person might be reading by candlelight or perhaps they're looking at a photograph of a deceased family member by candlelight. But we get the sense that the lighting is very much um, you know, focused on this area. Everything else is really dark and moody and open. And so this is a little bit different, say, from like uh, Latour, who also paints with uh, candlelight um, or does images of people like with candlelight. Latour is Baroque. Um, and so we could say like, um, I don't know what's a good one here, but I mean, this is probably the most famous one, which is the Mary Magdalene. Um, and so we can see the same type of high contrast, um, chiaroscuro being taken into consideration, uh, very moody, um, and, uh, but still our form is highly defined. You see, like, we have even over here in the shadow on the arm of, um, I think this is St. Sebastian, um, that there's a, a really defined edge. So like when we look at Latour, who was very famous, like even here, um, this is a, a more moody painting uh, with uh, less refined form. We can still see like in here, we still have harder edges. But when we go back to the Soro, hard edges are gone. And we have all this openness and it's establishing the mood and we can do things like we can speculate, okay, maybe this person is in mourning. Maybe this person is sad. And the reason that we can do that is because the mood is really established for us to give us an openness, right? Like it's very open in definition. So when we look at Soro, I don't know where this is going to take me, but this is a nice Soro painting, a uh, drawing here. I don't know where we're going to end up going here. Uh, we're going to go to a digital printing place. So when we look at the Soro, and it is accurate, by the way, that's why I'm going to use it. We can see that there is openness to the form. And we can see Mark transversing from here, oh look, that's nice. So there's Mark transversing from the background onto the form and back off of the form on the other side. That drawing, everybody, that movement of the mark through the form is part of the thing that's creating the openness to the form. So when we focus on drawing with value and we look at value in drawing, it does create hard edges, okay? Um, and as it creates harder edges, we do see, um, you know, like a strong edge, but in Soro's drawings, we can see that they are um, still very much, sorry, I guess that's not gonna give me a larger drawing. Uh, they're still, even though this is a harder edge, there's still some softness to the edge, do you see? And as a result of that softness, there's still um, a lack of line. And line now disappears. It's now no longer line as idea. It is edge as form. And that's really what we want to sort of focus on with our value-based drawing. So I highly suggest you spend some time like looking at the work 
the drawings of Sorel. So, um, you know, so we're going to use your pastel paper. The reason we're going to use this is because the texture of the paper is different from the mixed media paper. So the texture of the paper is what we call the tooth. Okay, the tooth is formed during the paper making process. Hot press paper, like one of the sides for your mixed media paper, it goes through a pressing when it's hot and this smashes the fibers down and um, basically like makes them smooth. And uh, cold press paper, like the pastel paper, the texture is left alone. It doesn't go through a hot pressing. And so the paper has a lot of tooth to it. Now the tooth is designed to um, hold material. So uh, this paper is great for pastel. It's great for charcoal. We're also gonna today utilize our graphite on it. And you're gonna use your graphite for your homework. Okay, graphite crayons and pencils. So uh, let's go ahead. Let's do the same exact thing we just did y'all but I want to do it on the pastel paper, not the sphere. We're not going to do the sphere, but what I mean is we're going to do the little transition of value. So go ahead and take your graphite pencil, your, your crayon, and somewhere on your page off to the side, you don't put it right in the middle, go ahead and do your darkest value, as dark as you can. Okay, so there's my nice dot value. And then again, I'm gonna lift out with my pressure. And this time just go up and down, don't go in circles. And see what happens in terms of the difference. Pay close, I don't want, do not try to obliterate the texture. I want the texture of the paper. That's why we're changing the paper. So my paper's not white, it's a little bit off-white. Your paper is white, I believe. So as you get closer and closer to the lighter, high key values, I want you to drift off into the, the paper texture. So we want this texture to come through. That's the tooth of the paper. We want the tooth of the paper to come through. Okay, so right below that, go ahead and make a little boundary box. Okay. We need, we need to not use all of the pastel paper, y'all, because we need it for your egg drawings, but that's only four drawings. So you should have enough to do this, but you want enough that you don't mess up. <laughs> or if you do mess up, you've got extra paper. Okay, now let's go ahead and just establish our, our horizon line. Now, usually I wouldn't have you draw with, with line, but we need to for this. And then I want you please to establish your two vanishing points. We did cover two point perspective, right? Yeah. Oh, good. Okay, cool. <laughs> so after you've established your two vanishing points, go ahead and establish your corner, keep everything nice and light. And then go ahead and connect your corner to your vanishing points. This corner is closer to the left side. So let's make the left side smaller than the right side because of the perspective. And then, so you've got this now and you have this. So then you're gonna go from that point to the back and from this point to that side. And so now we have the top, which looks like this. So keep it nice and light because you don't want lines at the end. OK, 
Okay, so let's play around with our light logic here. Let's pull the light from, hmm, I don't know. Let's pull the light from bottom left. So this will be the brightest part right here. Okay, so along this edge here, it's going to get dark. And what's actually going to happen is it's going to be pretty dark right along that, that edge. And this whole side is going to be pretty dark like this. But along the edge, it's actually going to be the darkest right here. And then it will get lighter because the light here, like it's really blocked right here, but here is going to kind of come around into here. So it'll be a little bit lighter as it goes back. Now the top is going to get even less light, so we can just go ahead and put in the top a little bit darker than the side. And really enjoy the feeling of the chart of the uh, graphite on the paper. Like I like the feeling. It's kind of like I can feel my my tool kind of vibrating. Now you can definitely have a harder edge in there, but again, try not to draw a line. I'm just going to darken that edge and blend out from it. Same thing up here, I'm going to darken the edge and then blend out from it. I'm just kind of make it a nice solid value up there. Now our bottom area here, we wanna go ahead and assign a value to. So we're gonna pull that value down through here. It's gonna get a bit lighter here. Then it's gonna get darker again. And watch what I do here. I'm just gonna actually draw right through the background, right onto the cube and blend it away. This is kind of like classic Siro back there, which is these two values coming together. Now we can go ahead and on the back side of the, the, the cube, go ahead and just make that a little bit darker. Now over here, let's bring it up to about the same darkness. And then the background back here, let's go ahead and just apply a value back there. Let the texture of the paper come through, y'all. Let the texture of the paper come through. Then you should just go back in and you want to solidify your darks again. And again, you're not making lines, you're making solid places where values are touching one another. So you can see why, you know, we really have to start with perspective and contour because it gives you the understanding of like how forms exist together in, in space kind of thing, right? But um, what, what most of drawing is for me is volume, mass, and value. And so this is where we start to get into value and the value describes the volume.
Now to sharpen these crayons, again, you're just gonna use your knife. Kind of, you can just actually just like, like whittle. Or you can use a piece of sandpaper and just spin. And again, we're trying to transition value. So by that, <clears throat> I mean that you can draw your values over the form. Now here where you have that edge, like there probably would be a little bit of a shadow line there. So just put that in there lightly and then blend it into the light. Are we ready to move on? Okay, so go ahead and make a new boundary box. And what we're gonna do is we're just gonna draw a finger together Okay, now we're gonna do this quite just, so we're just gonna make it up. So go ahead and draw a pretty long rectangle. Keep it kind of on the thinner side like that. So then just go ahead and give it a thickness. Again, this should look like a French fry. You're making like a French fry, you know, it's obviously like, it's like a frozen French fry. So once you've established your frozen French fry and I'm just shooting, I'm, I'm basically just doing like 45 degree angles, y'all. They're not like going to a vanishing point. It's not perfect, uh, perfect perspective. It's more isometric. So everything's just kind of like 45 degrees, okay. Once I've made that rectangle, I'm actually going to just divide it visually in half. And now this space here, I'm gonna divide that in half. What are the bones in your finger called, y'all? What are the bones in your fingers called? Phalanges. Mm-hmm. What are the bones in your toes called? Metatarsals. Ooh, you do have metatarsals, but I was thinking phalanges. <laughs> so your, your toes are like our phalanges, your fingers are phalanges. The top of your hand is your um, metacarpals. The top of your foot is your metatarsals. The bones in your wrist are your carpals, the bones uh, right below your ankle are your tarsals. Um, so in each finger, this isn't like your thumb, but each of your digits, you have three phalanges. And if you take your hand boop, 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 and you measure the distance from the first knuckle to the first big knuckle, if you take that measurement and measure the distance for the rest of the finger, you'll see that it's a one-to-one -one ratio. Now, if you take the distance from this knuckle to that knuckle and that knuckle to the end of the finger, you'll see it's a one-to-one -one ratio. So when you draw a finger, if you start with a rectangle like this, and this is for like a flat finger, y'all. If half the rectangle is the first phalange, then if you divide the space in half, you'll have the second and third phalange. Your thumb actually has two phalanges, not three. So we're just making a finger. This is like, just kind of like, I don't know. It's like a fake toy finger, whatever. It's just laying on a table, no big deal. 
the top of the finger is generally pretty angular. The bottom of the finger is the pads and it's pretty round, okay? So what we wanna do is just go ahead and round this part like that. Round, round. Now here we're gonna cross contour. We're gonna do a bit of an arc, a bit of an arc a bit of an arc here. We can do a bit of an arc for the end of the fingernail and then round at the end. And then here we're gonna do a dip, and a dip, dip, dip. And then this kind of, depends on the fingernail, but you can go up or go down, depends on what you wanna do. Now let's do our light logic. Uh, we'll pull our light logic. Um, let's pull it from like about here. That means the top will be bright and then this would all be shaded. Let's go ahead and deal with some of this background value. So there's going to be a shadow coming off of the finger, kind of coming through here. And go ahead and take that value you just put there and bring it up, not as dark, but just transcend some of that value up onto the finger's edge. Apply your value down here. Bring that value up here. This kind of reminds me like, I don't know, this story, I don't think it would be offensive, I don't know, but when I was younger, I mowed lawns with my brother and in Florida and we were mowing around this big lake and I looked over and my brother was like waving to me. My brother was never really, at this age, my brother wasn't really very nice to me. <laughs> and I was like, well, that's weird. My brother's waving at me. So I was like waving back like, hey, we're really getting along. This is really great. And then he started like flicking me off and screaming at me. So I was like, oh, that's, that's more like it. I wonder what he wants. So like I ran over and he had, um, unfortunately had an accident and he lost part of his finger. And so then they made him this really expensive like prosthetic, prosthetic finger. And he didn't, he never wore it, but he would like you, like he would try to wear it. And so like, you'd be like in the house and you'd find this like little finger. And it was like perfectly, you know, it was like, a $2,000 finger and um, he would just like leave it around. And this reminds me of that. <laughs> classic, classic uh, Vaughn siblings there. I'm like, why is my brother being nice to me? And like, this is weird. So right here is where the bottom of the nail is gonna go. And so I'm just gonna go ahead and make that darker underneath the shadow of the nail. And then over here on this side, there's a little bit of a dip, right? Where the, the nail is like here between the edge and the nail. And so I'm actually gonna make that like a little bit darker right there because it's dipping down. And then I'm gonna pull around the side and the outside edge of the nail right here, I'm gonna make that a bit darker like that. So I'm making the boundary of the nail with shadow rather than line. Now, 
this side of the of the the nail bed is going to be bright so i'm not going to apply any value there or the area around the nail but over here i want to make that darker to make that bright stick out so i go dark light dark light dark And now I've decided that that's going to be dark. So I want to transcend, I want to move that and transcend it around the value over here. Okay, now a finger has knuckles. Knuckles are not lines, they are form. Okay, so every knuckle is like a piece of fabric. So if I'm drawing a piece of fabric, it's going to have darks, darker parts inside the core of the shadow of a fold, say mid-tones and then lights and then dark on the other side of the light to make the light step forward. So each knuckle is not a line. I want you to think about each knuckle as being dark and light. So you have dark and then light and then dark and then light and then dark. So they're not lines. And where it's dark, as it transcends into the side, go ahead and make the side a bit darker because it's dark on dark, which means that it is double dark. Double dark. So then same thing over here. And we're just making this up so it's not necessarily like a real knuckle. But what it definitely is not, it's absolutely not a line. It has dimension. It's where your skin is sitting on top of a joint between two phalanges. And so that means it's going to have dimension because the skin's getting pushed and pulled and it's forming into something that has a bulge. Go ahead and strengthen the shadow line where the finger is touching the surface of the table. And then maybe the, the fingernail has a bit of shadow on it as well. I've decided not to use digital drawing today. I feel like I'm done with digital drawing for, for the, maybe for the week. So then if I make the value back here darker, then the value on the top of the finger will step forward. So there's our finger using value. And here we go. Go ahead and make a new boundary box. You can flip the paper over if you need to. Okay, so now in the center, we're going to draw the sphere in a nice light gesture. So gesture being about just shape, okay, not edge. It's not a hard drawing. It's not contour. It's a feeling, like feel the circle, feel the circle. Okay, go ahead and find the center of the circle. Okay, and go ahead and put in another circle. And then in the sense of that, put it in another circle. So you made like a bullseye. Okay. Now go ahead and shade this part. Keep everything really light. Go ahead and shade this part. Okay, the outside of this ring is a little bit darker. That. 
Okay, then go ahead and apply the same type of shading to the outside ring. Actually, it could be a bit bigger on mine. Maybe more like that. Keep everything nice and light. Okay, so I'm just going to draw a little bit of an eye together. Okay. So inside the eye, right, like in, in, underneath all of the eyelids and stuff is your eyeball that sits inside the eye socket. The eye socket is created by the frontal bone on the top. On the side, you have maxilla. And on the other side, you have zygomatic. OK, so it's literally like a hole that the eyeball goes into. So what we're going to do is think about that hole. So go ahead and just kind of like apply some shadow like this, nice and light. You can see how light I'm doing it. So this is basically the construction is like this. You have maxilla through here, frontal bone through here, zygomatic through there. That's the nose there. Okay, so the eyeball goes boop into that spot. To keep everything nice and light, nice and value based. Okay, now what you want to do is come about halfway between the top of this circle and that circle, come about halfway down. And down here, let's go ahead and do the same thing. This is the bottom of the circle, so halfway up. And then we're going to go ahead and just draw an arc. Draw an arc. Okay. And then just right below the top of that circle you did here, draw an arc. And then right above the edge of that circle there, draw an arc. The white of the eye is the scilia, the color of the eye is the iris, and the black of the eye is the pupil. Now, some people have monolids and some people have hooded eyes, okay? So a person with a monolid uh, wouldn't have much of a crease there, and someone with a hooded eye would have a crease. What the crease is basically is the way that the muscle is uh, laying across the eye socket. So the muscle that surrounds the eye, so inside the eye socket, you have the eye, and then you have this muscle that goes around the eye, okay? It's a big muscle, it goes all the way through there. That's your orbicular oris, okay? Uh, I always get it backwards, orbicular oculi, <laughs> okay? And then that's the, this big muscle that goes all around the eye. Okay, and then on the top here, you have your eyelid. That's the levator palpebrae superioris. That is the top eyelid that opens and closes. Uh, well, that one um, closes the eye, the orbicular oculi opens the eye. So go ahead and find that edge. Again, you're not drawing lines, you're drawing values. We're gonna make this a, a person who has a crease, okay, like that. And then down here, the bottom eyelid is pretty thin. If, you, if you're a person like I am and you wear um, eyeliner and mascara, then you, you know that there's a thickness to that bottom eyelid. So we're gonna show that thickness by actually leaving this sort of space here empty and putting a value underneath it. Now here, go ahead, we're gonna solidify that crease by putting value around it and inside the crease, and then blending it up.
Now, if we pull our light from the top, which is usually where light comes on the portrait, then the eyelid will cast a shadow. And that's why we see it so defined. And then that shadow will blend out onto the scilia, the white and the iris, and maybe onto the pupil. Rarely do you see everything of someone's iris and pupil. If you see everything of someone's iris and pupil, that means they're really scared. So in that sense, you would be like looking for like the alligator that's chasing them or something. Then go ahead and apply some more darker value to the pupil. And then the iris on the outside is gonna have a darker ring. And then you can go ahead and just pull the values over that. The bottom of the iris is being covered by that bottom eyelid. So all you're doing is slowly building up and strengthening your darks and letting the original sort of light values you put down remain as sort of the light. Do not do eyelashes. Generally, I suggest to students that they do not do eyelashes. Why? Because they're really hard to do. And every eyelash has light and dark and midtone. And so like usually a student would just draw them like these like symbolic lines and they're definitely not. Over here in the corner is the tear duct, which is like another little sphere. So again, thinking about your light logic, light's coming from the top, it's casting a shadow down onto the eyeball. Okay, the eyeball sits inside the eye socket. Surrounding the eyeball is the orbicular or, uh, oculi. Across the top of the eyeball is the levator palpebrae superioris. So that's what you're seeing when you see that crease. Now, if someone doesn't have a crease, if they have um, a, um, I hope I got them the right way around. I'm, I always get them a bit backwards, but if they have um, a hooded eye, then often there may not be a very defined crease in there, but that doesn't mean that the, the muscle underneath is any different. It just means that the way that it sits out from the skin uh, is, is different. When we start talking about drawing the figure, y'all, I want you to recognize that every difference in the figure is, is a difference that is beautiful. Diversity is beautiful. And, you know, the way that the body exists, um, it's just amazing, amazing, amazing. And differences in, you know, like European features versus Asian features versus even like Eurasian features, they create the, just the beauty of the human figure. Okay, so a little eye tutorial there. Okay, all of it based on line, no value really used at all. Uh, values used in the very beginning to sort of establish form, but very quickly, uh, sorry, line is used in the very beginning as a gesture, but then very quickly disappears into value. If you draw this way, you draw slowly, you don't ever have to erase. Okay. So 